All right. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Katie Bradford Osborne. I am the founder and curator of Roaring Artist Gallery. We are a fully virtual art gallery that exhibits exclusively the art of women identifying and non-binary artists. And we are here today for the very first artist talk in our Audacity series for our Audacity exhibition that is currently running in our 3D gallery. And you'll get to see a preview of that very shortly, but um, I'm so excited. I say that all the time, but I am so excited to hear what these three artists have to say. It's going to be really great. So we have Dara Wena, we have Katie Gresham, and we have Heaven Needham here today. And so let's get started. I'm going to take us to our 3D gallery. We're going to do a super quick run through just to see their artwork. And then we're going to launch into what they have to say. All right. All right. Darwena is a multidisciplinary artist and mother of two, maintaining a home studio in Northern Colorado. She works in a variety of mediums, including painting, drawing, printmaking, crochet, and collage. Born in Chicago, Dar received her BA in studio art with minors in art history and French in 2005 from Northeastern Uni Illinois University after many long pauses, three different universities, and lots of travel abroad. Post-graduation, Dara worked for prominent collectors, galleries, and museums in Chicago as a picture framer and art handler, as well as managing exhibitions at Gallery Mornea, a space for emerging and mid-career artists in Evanston, Illinois. She developed a thriving studio practice in the historic Cornelia Arts Building, where she exhibited alongside fellow artists for three years before moving to Napa, California in 2007. There, she spent the next 13 years juggling the demands of motherhood while participating in local art markets, teaching handmade classes, handwork classes, running an Etsy shop, as well as various artistic collaborations before relocating to Colorado in 2020. All right. And I will leave your statement to you, Dara, because I think you'll be talking about these things anyway. And I will hand it over to you. Just a second, you're on mute. <laughs> How many times there. does that happen? I mean, seriously, <laughs> you're on mute. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you. I'm so happy to be here tonight. Um, even with all the glitches, um, I had some on my end too. So um, I just wanted to say thank you so much to Katie and to Marin for during this show and um, putting it together. It looks so amazing and I was just thrilled to be included in it. So thank you both. Um, I am going to talk tonight specifically about the piece that's in the show, um, but kind of touching on that piece as um, a, sorry, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get used to seeing this thing here, um, trying to, to talk spe more specifically about my connection um, to crochet as a medium and why it's important to me and why I chose to, why I am using it right now. Um, 
So the piece that's in the show um, is called Edna's Garden. Um, it's primarily crochet and um, fabric. There's a lot of stitching in it, obviously, um, and some embroidered elements. Um, but the the primary structure and you know kind of scaffolding of the piece is is crocheted. Um, and Edna was my um, mater my um, grandmother's name and her grandmother, my great grandmother as well. Um, and when I started making this piece, the, the center of it um, started, I started it like a year ago um, when I was working on some other crochet work and it got put away and I didn't really, it, it, you know, it's just one of those things as artists, sometimes we just put our work away and then we come back to it. And then when I came back to it, it felt different to me. It felt, um, I, it, the shape of it seemed more like a breast. It felt more um, organic um, and less decorative as it, as it had started. And so I started building off of this center um, piece and um, it just really struck me that um, there was an energy to it. It had a very maternal feeling um, the shape of the breast and it just, I felt the energy kind of of my grandmother in that. And so as I was creating it, um, these little um, flowers and smaller breasts that kind of came off the, the center of that, it really solidified that idea for me because um, she was the center of our family. She was the glue, you know, she was the matriarch. She was she was the center of this this love that we all that we all came from, and so it just um, it seemed very fitting that it it became this piece. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about crochet tonight. Um, yarn over, pull through is uh, for anyone who knows how to crochet. You know that that's the very beginning of, of any crochet project. You start you yarn over your hook, you pull through a loop, you make another loop, you pull it through. And it's that simple. And you just are creating a series of loops and knots. And that's at its essence, that's what crochet is. It's the, this connecting these things together through these loops. Um, and crochet is my love language. That just came to me today as I was thinking about why it's so important to me. And it's not just because I learned it when I was a kid and I've, I've had this history with it and this connection to my grandmother, but I truly love doing it more than so many other things. I feel like there's so much um, to it and there's, it can, it's so expansive to me. And I feel like there's, um, my, you know, my grandmother made these very practical crocheted items like you know, blankets and hats and things, you know, like that, but they were so imbued with this, with her love. And I feel like I'm, I'm doing that in, in my own way. I'm, I'm, I'm carrying that on, um, even though I'm not necessarily making blankets or hats. Um, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my grandmother and, and the lineage of crochet. Um, she taught me to crochet when I was a kid, I was maybe eight or nine. Um, and her grandmother and great grandmother, uh, her mother and grandmother. So my great and great great grandmothers both crocheted. Um, so it's definitely this 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 thing that's like in our in in my lineage. Um, and these hooks are hooks that she gave to me after she passed away. They belong to my great great grandmother, and um, I use these hooks. Um, I use them on the piece that I that I have here. Um, mostly, I mean, they're real small hooks. So I'm using them mostly when I'm crocheting in thread or really small yarn. But um, all the hooks I have from my great grandmothers, I use. Um, and this is an example of um, it's like a little pot holder doily that my great great grandmother made. Um, and I just, I, I, it's so beautiful, and the 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 work is so intricate. And even though it's I mean, yeah, I have it hanging on my wall because to me it is a piece of art, but to think that, you know, they were making work out of crochet that was just so, so practical. It was doilies and, you know, lace on your pillowcases and um, although that's not really practical, but, you know, 100 years ago, I guess it was, you know, um, and the just the handwork is just the attention to detail. I, I, I just, I love it so much. And um, so when my grandmother my grandmother passed away um, almost nine years ago now. And 
she uh, had started this Afghan. That was her thing. She would make Afghans for everyone in our family. And we all have one, um, thankfully. Um, and she started this Afghan before she went into the hospital, um, but she, she never was able to finish it. And so my grandfather gave it to me and I, I finished it and it's on our couch now. And we, we use it all the time to, you know, snuggle with. And um, so kind of backtracking a little bit, um, she passed away when my kids were pretty young. So even though I was very close to her growing up, um, we lived in two different states when I became a mother. And so she didn't really get to know my kids very well. Um, and I was, you know, that was always a hard thing. But um, at, this, at the time too, when she, as I said, my kids were pretty small when she passed away at four and two, I wasn't making artwork really then. I, I wasn't the artist who could make art with my kids around. I, I made art before I had kids and then I had kids and like everything kind of stopped. You know, I didn't, I couldn't really reconcile those two things. Um, but I could, I crafted a lot. I sewed, I, you know, I obviously crocheted. Um, and that was easy because, you know, I could take it wherever I went. I could put crochet in a bag and drive my kid around and he would fall asleep and I could have a crochet project to work on. So it was always like this touchstone that I had. Um, it kept my hands busy, it kept my mind at ease. Um, and I would, I just would always go back to crochet in times of, you know, when I needed something. Um, and so after my grandmother passed, I started this project uh, called You Are Loved, where I just create, I just crocheted these hearts and would give them to people, donate them. You know, it was kind of a um, craft for charity, you know, type of thing, which my grandmother also did. So I felt this connection to her expressing love through this craft in that way and me kind of carrying it on, but it also helped during my grief. You know, I was very close to her, as I said. And so this being able to create these little hearts, even though they seem kind of, you know, they're just this simple pattern, but they really meant a lot to me and they really helped me through a difficult time. Um, and as, as um, Katie said in the, my backstory, I had an Etsy shop. So, you know, I did, when the kids were still little, I was, um, they also attended, my boys attended a Waldorf school. And so there's a real um, attention to craft and handwork in, in the Waldorf education. And so um, some, I would cr crochet these river rocks for the classrooms and for teachers and, and, um, you know, kept just kept learning new stitch patterns with crochet. I, I was um, kind of teaching myself more complex um, things and reading patterns and, and kind of taking it um, a little bit further from what my grandmother taught me as a kid. Um, and then we're getting closer into as my boys are getting older, I'm getting a little more free time here. Um, I would make these wall hangings, these crocheted mandalas, which again, they were portable. I could take them with me anywhere. It really wasn't until I had to attach them to a hoop that I needed to be in one place working on the ground. But these were commission pieces that I did. Um, and, and it felt like, even though I wasn't making artwork, so to say, it, it still felt like somebody wants this. They want to hang it on their wall. It's bringing them joy. It's color, it's happiness and, and it's fiber, you know? And I thought it was, um, uh, just a nice alternative to feeling, you know, stuck because I wasn't painting or I wasn't being in my studio making other work. I still had this outlet um, and that satisfied a lot of uh, my cre creative needs that I had at the time. So that's, that was a little backstory of crochet. Um, and then I just jumping forward to getting closer to where we are now in the present, um, talking about kind of how crochet help has helped me in my life through difficult times. Um, we moved, as Katie said, we moved to Colorado um, a year and a half, a year and a half ago. It was December of 2020. Um, and, you know, it's the middle of the pandemic. We just uprooted our lives. We had a really, really close community in California. Um, and it was really hard to leave, but we made the right decision. Anyways, that's a whole other story. But when we moved here, um, it was the middle of winter. I couldn't use anything in my studio because there was no heat. And so I was really at high anxiety and 
depression, <laughs> to be honest, it was a real low period. And I just pulled out my yarn and my hooks and I just started crocheting without thinking about anything. I wasn't thinking, I wasn't trying to follow a pattern. I wasn't trying to make an object, uh, you know, a blanket or anything. I just needed that connection. Um, and it was really a very prolific and time. And I just created these, these kind of abstract biomorphic shaped pieces that I just let the, the hook and the yarn go and tried to figure out like, well, if I move it this way, what will happen if I connect this over here? And it was really liberating. I had never crocheted that way before. Um, even with the mandalas, they were still pretty structured and there was a a way in order to do it. And with these pieces, it really brought out um, just so much more freedom for me and opened up a, a pretty big door um, and brought together, you know, it, it felt like a synthesis of my paintings um, and collage work that I've done. And it just felt very natural. And it, it really helped quite a bit with my mental health for sure. So here is, <laughs> If this was this was what our living room looked like. Can you see that big pile of yarn there? My kids hated it. They would come home and they're like, mom, there's nowhere to even sit. I was like, you have a bedroom, you're fine. You know? It was like everything was taken over with yarn. Um, oh, and there's the blanket. I didn't realize that was in the, that was in the picture. There's that, there's the um, Afghan that I finished crocheting after my grandma passed. Um, so yeah, so I just would bring my yarn into this into the living room and sit on my butt and just crochet. And um, this middle piece was this middle picture is um, I had after I had done a couple of these crocheted freeform pieces, I hung them up and I wasn't really able to work in my studio like I said because it was so cold. But um, it was kind of fun to see how the crochet pieces talk to the prints and how the and the crochet pieces talk to the paintings and the color and the movement. And um, I think that's one of my favorite things about being uh, working multidisciplinary is the, even when you're not intentionally trying to make something connect to something else you've done, it's there. And you, you know, you see these threads as an artist and it's, I think it's really satisfying. Um, and then this last studio image is one of the more recent pieces. Um, of working on um, the, the Edna's garden. You can see it here in the middle. Um, I was working on lots of other bigger pieces and um, just trying different, more sculptural things out with the, the motif of the breast um, and the flower. And it was a pretty busy active time in the studio the, the last six, eight months or so. Um, so the way Edna's garden came together, like I said, the, 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 I started with this, centerpiece, um, which also just kept growing. I kept adding more fabric underneath it and um, different elements to it. And it was really just a huge puzzle. It was, there was no rhyme or reason necessarily. I mean, I kind of drew out this little uh, sketch on my iPad, which I've never even done that before. That was the first time I'd ever done that. I'm pretty old school in how I work. Um, but I was like, oh, I can do that on my iPad, cool. Um, so it kind of gave me some visual idea, but working in crochet, it's not, you know, it's not like a painting where if it doesn't, it doesn't work, I can just paint over it or erase it if it's a drawing. It was really like, okay, this piece has to fit here because this piece is going to fit here. And, you know, to rip out crochet stitches and try to un undo, you know, stitching, it's not so fun. You don't want to do that. So, um, yeah, it, it was a lot of thinking and um, trying to piece these puzzles, these puzzle pieces together. And it was so much fun. I mean, I had so much unbelievably, so much fun making this, this piece. Um, and here are some close-up shots of um, some of the flowers, some more of the, the breast shapes in there. Um, and then in the end, um, I love process. So I'm heavy on the process talk because I really love to see how artists make their work. And I think a lot of people do. So I included that here. Um, so basically that once I had pieced everything together, it was getting to the point where I'm like, do I keep making, do I keep going? How am I gonna contain it? How am I gonna frame it? 
And as a picture framer at heart, I have to have a frame around something. Like if this was on the wall, just like that, I'd lose my mind. I could, it couldn't, couldn't see it that way, you know? So I had to find a way to encapsulate this, this, this image now, this, this shape that I've created, this woman, I don't even, you know, this garden. And um, thankfully I have, um, from the making of those mandalas, um, my husband's in the wine business. And so he, we have a lot of wine barrel hoops that I would also use for making the mandalas. Um, and I had a really big one, a bigger one than I've ever used before. And, it, and I had it and I didn't even know I had it. So I decided to create um, that as the frame, like and contain the Edna's garden in that. Um, and it worked out really well. And it, 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 it managed to hold itself as a frame. Um, and here's just kind of like some side shots so we it, we can see it's like two inches deep so it gives it a nice like offset from the wall um so working with the breast that's kind of been where I've been going with my with crochet mostly in the last like eight months six eight months um there's many reasons I guess but it came about pretty organically I have to say um but it, it was just this coupling of using crochet as this way to kind of bring down my anxiety. But the, the, the image of a breast, the thought of a breast to me is just nurture, nurture, nurture. Um, and adding this element of color in there, it's joy, joy, joy. And I feel like that is um, so much of what is missing in, in the world, um, a pretty heightened sense of nurturing and mothering. I feel like we need to mother not only our families and our children, but we need to mother our world. Um, and it, they're just, they're just growing. I'm not, I'm not at the point yet with the work that I completely can say exactly where I see it going, but I know it, it's, it's going somewhere. And, and there's this constant omnipresence of, of that, of that balance of nurture and joy that I, that I feel when I'm making them. And I'm hoping that's what other people see and feel too. So um, lastly, I just thought I'd throw in there um, some growing back to the work that I'm, that I started last year, like those free form kind of crochet collage pieces. I just recently started a piece where I'm trying to go back to that and, and play with the, this, you know, playful, these playful organic biomorphic shapes and um, using fabric and crocheted elements together. So that's just some recent work that I'm doing right now. Um, and yeah, that's, that's what I have. I hope that was um, informative for you all. <laughs> um, I am also, I also paint and as Katie said, I do a lot of other uh, mixed media work, but I wanted to just specifically focus on crochet tonight. So there's my website and my handle at Instagram is just Darawina. It's a weird name. So just go with it all the way, you know, <laughs> website, Instagram. If you need to find me, that's, that's a, the easiest way to go. It's, it's a pretty unusual name. So, so thank you all for being here. And I really look forward to hearing what Katie and Heaven have to talk about too, about their work. Thank you. Mm, thank you so much, Dara. That was wonderful. I think that I've heard parts of your other kinds of art that you've done. This is the first time I really feel like I've heard and really delved into your crochet work. And that is a beautiful story. And I'm excited about the work that you're doing with these breasts. They're so beautiful with the floral motifs almost. They're beautiful. Does anybody have any questions for Dara? Thank you, Katie. I just wanted to say, I love, I've seen the garden piece, but having you explain it, like you can really see the lineage of, you know, your grandmother and the mother and all of the women together making this like beautiful thing. So I really valued knowing that story and it's so present in your work. Um, your colors are amazing. Do you just intuitively pick those or how often do you have to like plan it out? Um, you know, I wish I could say that there was like some formula or 
great like color theory class that I took or something like that. But color's just always been, I've always loved color. I've always worked a lot in color. And I think it's just, um, you know, it's, uh, I don't want to say I don't work at it because I do, but I, I feel like I see so many things in color and it's just like, well, what happens if I take this blue and I add this green to it and put those together? It's a language. I, I often think about color as a language. And so, you know, I like, I want my language to be joyful and, and, and intentional. And so when I'm choosing colors, I, I think that way, like I, it's, it's natural, but it's also intentional, I guess, if that makes sense. But I've always loved, I've just always loved color for as long as I can remember. So I think it's just one of those things, the more you use it, the more fluid it becomes and is part of your vocabulary, you know? Thank you for that question. It was an awesome question. Does anybody else have any questions or statements? It's not a question, but um, one of like your last slides with like the single breasts some of them look like flowers almost. Yeah. And I, I think they're so beautiful. The layers on top of them, um, they're gorgeous. And she's right. Your colors are amazing. I, yeah, I really, really like where you're going and I'm excited to see, you know, where it kind of ends up to. Thank you. It's, that's so awesome to hear the feedback. I mean, yeah, some of them intentionally have the shape of the flower and that's, I'm purposefully trying to, to like merge those two things, the breast and the flower, because I mean, not to get too geeky, but if anyone has ever seen the inside, you know, the, the mammary glands, I mean, you can't help but like think like, oh, hello, great creator out there. You did this. <laughs> There's intention there, you know, I mean, it's, it's amazing. So um, yeah, I'm excited with this, with this series too, to just see it evolve and, and keep it going. So thank you for the feedback. It's nice to hear that. I appreciate it. I'm excited too. There are such roots to this project, it feels like, yeah, going all the way back to your great, great grandmother and moving forward into now that you're a mother and you have children of your own moving forward into the future. I think that that's a really beautiful thing. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what you do next. Afghans, but they're going to get a, a lot of crocheted breasts. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes, sometimes I think that's funny I'm like oh nanny we called my grandma nanny oh she left us all these great afghans and I'm like sorry guys you're just gonna get a bunch of boob artwork <laughs> you know <laughs> thinking my kids like no I'll, we'll take the blankets mom that's fine <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay I have boys so you know they're a little like whatever <laughs> Well, they'll grow up to appreciate it. Yeah. No, they, <laughs> they will. They will. They're, they are. They are growing to appreciate that. I, I agree, and I'm teaching them that, so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Dara, if you have, if you don't have anything else to say, and nobody else has anything to say, we will go ahead and move forward to Katie. But thank you so much. That thank was wonderful. You. Thank you so much. All right. How is my audio right now? Am I sounding normal? Okay. I wanted to make sure before I started Katie's bio. Katie Gresham is a visual artist living outside of Washington, D.C. Gresham holds an MA in International Peace and Conflict Resolution from American University. She worked for several years in research and communications. After the birth of her first child, Gresham turned to art to reconnect with her identity and process her experiences of motherhood. Her artwork has been shown in local galleries and online exhibitions. Gresham was a contributor to Linka Clayton's Mother's Day Collaborative Project and Book. Gresham's work explores the inherent tension and caregiving within a society that provides insufficient support to mothers. Her mother figures are slumped, hold themselves up under immense weight, and either faceless or with faces overwhelmed by intense emotion. In her embroidery, Gresham's self-portraits are nearly camouflaged against stained towels. The faces convey emotions that are seen as inappropriate for a mother, rage, exhaustion, regret, ambivalence. Gresham's work normalizes ambivalence as part of the maternal experience, pushing back on the myth of the perfect mother by validating the complicated reality of caregiving and asserting the value of caregivers' identities. I love that statement, and I am excited to hear what you have to say. <laughs> so I will turn it over to you, Katie. I need um, Dara to exit the share screen before I can share mine.
All right. Um, thank you, Katie. I uh, thank you for asking for me to take part in a talk tonight. It is such an honor. So my name is also Katie, and I am an artist living outside of Washington, D.C. And for this talk, I wanted to focus on the body of work that's developed since I became a mother uh, the first time in 2017 and then with my second child in 2019. The title is portraying, portraying the weight of m motherhood because all of this work really examines the physical, mental, and emotional weight um, of m mothering or caregiving for small ch ch children and its effects on the caregiver and how sharply um, that weight contrasts with the mainstream um, messaging that we get around what it should be like when we become a parent. Um, so as a bit of personal background, my first postpartum experience was not what I expected, <laughs> but I don't know if we ever know what to expect. It was challenging and it was challenging in ways that I didn't think about, um, the emotional aspect of it. Um, the negative emotional aspect of it was very surprising to me. Um, there were times in the most challenging moments where I felt almost physically like I was drowning or suffocating. And it wasn't until my first child was 18 months old that I felt like I could come up for a breath of air. Um, it was a little later that I learned the term much, 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 much essence, um, which was well known. I just had never heard of it because it wasn't spoken about in mainstream media, or at least what I had come across. And it basically relates this postpartum period of becoming a mother similar to how it is when you're a teenager. You know, your hormones is shifting, your body is shifting, who you are is shifting and how you fit in the world. All of that's changing. And it was like a light went off in my head and I finally understood like, oh, this may not be good, but it's normal and I'm not alone. Um, so as I'm going through this period of shifting, um, it was also through the same period with my first child that I left my former career and began an art practice as my career while being a primary caregiver, um, that I started that sort of push and pull of wanting to make work, but not knowing how. Um, I tried painting, but it was difficult, as Dara kind of talked about, to sort of make the time and the mess and the space for it. So this piece um, finally kind of came out and about during a period where I was like, I'm going to assert my individual identity in whatever way I can, instead of simply just saying, I'm a mother. And this piece is called The Topography of Motherhood, of motherhood During Pandemic. I began it in December 2019. So I began it before the pandemic started and my second child was six months old at this point. So she was still nursing. She was still waking all the time. And this started as just a way for me to claim myself and make marks on paper to claim that I am still pursuing art. So every night or every night I could, after I put her to bed at eight or 9 p.m. because newborns don't actually always fall asleep really early, I would take this three by five inch sketchbook and make these marks. And as I got more and more of these patterns and more and more of these marks, I began to see that they connected, that there was a rhythm and a, and a pattern to my, my, my mark making. And as we got closer to March 2020, when the pandemic began, I began to collage these together and I began to notice how much this image reflected the anxiety I was feeling as a mother of two young children at the beginning of the uncertainty and the um, unsafety of a pandemic. So that's sort of this piece. And it was sort of the first coming out, I guess you could say, of my art practice from the sort of this postpartum period. Um, and another thing I did during this time to kind of reassert myself was I looked for the art in motherhood. And often I did this by anytime my kids were physically on me in a weird way, especially if it was painful or awkward or weird, um, I would 
take a selfie or whatever version of that I could. Um, usually they're on your arms or on your legs. So the composition wasn't always there. Um, these photo references became these comic book kind of drawings. Um, I, of course, exaggerated the number of children in each scene. I hope they convey sort of, sort of some humor and some playfulness at the same time, the gravity and the seriousness of the weight is still there. I'll sort of click through a few of these just to get a sense of how I'm going through them. These live in a um, sketchbook project from the Brooklyn Art Library. It hasn't yet been submitted in. But you know these these women are holding holding up weight, <laughs> and they're trying to go about their daily lives as these mischievous, playful, needy, um, childlike forms cavort around and up and on top of them. And this one, of course, is a bedtime scene where the where the mother is literally chained to the crib. She cannot leave, she cannot pursue her own artistic practice, in my case, or her own goals, her own self, um, until her children are asleep. And these comic sketches have directly contributed to a collage series that I have developed. So you'll see three collages that are going right back to those um, sketches. These collages are uh, on nine by 12 paper, the mother is parchment paper, so she's really neutral and tan. She's faceless. She's fading into the background. And her minions, that's kind of what I call them to myself, her minions are colorful, they're vibrant, and they're all over. The minion painted pieces are actually discarded artwork made by my children, you know, finger paint and things like that. Um, and the parchment paper actually was also used um, to make flatbread, and it wasn't too, wasn't too dirty, so I kept it. This one is called You'll, m m You'll m Miss This One Day. This is You Should Try More Self-Care. This is Why Can't She Just Bounce Back? Because there's a chain of minions dragging her down, obviously. Um, so alongside that collage practice and sketching practice, I have an embroidery practice. In fall 2019, I guess, I don't know exactly why, I don't remember, but I decided to, maybe it was fall 2020, it could have been pandemic <laughs> related boredom. I decided to teach myself how to embroider. Um, I, I got books out of the library. My mom had old hoops from the 70s or whenever that she sent up to me in the mail. And I just started to embroider. These are not the first things I did. Um, and just like Dara's work, it it's calming. Um, it's very calming. And it's a very easy way to feel like I'm making something. It kind of brings me back to my collage where I was just making individual marks at the end of the day. Um, even if I just get a few marks down, a few pieces of thread through, it feels like I did something um, unrelated to my mothering life. So for these embroidery works, these are done on kitchen towels. They've been stained and used in my house um, for several years and we decided to get new ones so I kind of hoarded these away until I decided to use them. I wish I remember what possessed me to do it the first time but I do not. I cut the towel in half really really roughly and I decided um, to do one of these faces. Now the story behind these faces is going back to that postpartum period where the rage and the exhaustion and the regret, the sadness, the complicated and the benevolence I felt um, made such a big mark on me because that was not anything I expected from early motherhood. And one way I coped in the moment, again, looking to find the art in my day to day, 
was whenever I was feeling those big feelings, I would step aside from my children and enact whatever I was feeling on my face and take a photo. So I had these series of photos in my phone that I was saving of me feeling deep emotions. I was feeling all the emotions that were not appropriate to express at my children. Um, that's still something I struggle with. And it's, I, I, I wonder, especially as um, the current parenting philosophies are around gentle or conscious parenting where you're being very intentional and in how you react to a child's emotions, I have a hard time knowing, well, what do I do with mine? And um, this work comes from that. The thread I used is almost camouflaged into these because of that. These are emotions that are often invisible. They're suppressed. We don't talk about it because that would mean you're, I don't know, a bad mom or it might be some shame. Um, it's difficult. I mean, it is mental health in a sense, and that's still a difficult thing to talk about in our society. So this is maternal rage, maternal exhaustion. and maternal ambivalence, which is the one in the show. What's interesting to me is it wasn't until this was pointed out to me a few weeks ago, um, but these are self-portraits. <laughs> of course, I'm using my own face from the selfie as I described to stitch them. Um, and there's a resemblance, I'm sure, but it never occurred to me to claim the title of self-portrait for them until recently. Um, one thing I'm looking forward to doing is I have a friend who's also an artist send me some photos of her enacting in intense emotions and I'm excited to stitch her face and see how that feels um, to see if that broadens this series of work for me or if it being a self-portrait is important um, to my practice of it. Um, one thing I've done more recently with these is begin to install them in my kitchen and around my house just to sort of see how it feels. I'm taking the domestic object of the towel and putting it back in its place. Um, this is my dishwasher, but I've also sort of folded them over and I'm experimenting can these be artistic photographs in and of themselves. So I've titled this one Washing Up. This one drip dry, both are showing a rage face and a sort of dark charcoal. So you can see the contrast instead of the camouflaged cream that I'd used before. And this is my triptych showing the three that you saw previously, maternal exhaustion, maternal rage, and maternal ambivalence. What I like about these series, um, especially seeing them in place, like in the kitchen or hanging on a clothesline in the bathroom, is it's almost as if the caregiver, the mother in this case, um, was so overcome by the emotion, she had to wipe it off her face before she could go about doing what she needed to do that day. Um, and that's the remnants of her feeling there on the towel. So to me, I think it's become obvious. It's, very important to portray and normalize the often intense negative emotions that can come up with caregiving and also the complicated feelings of I want to care for my child dearly I love them but I want some freedom and time away from them as well this this maternal and this maternal am am benevolence which if you know where to look is actually written about a lot in research type books and things like that I've I've since um, read and have learned more and more but it's not discussed very often in mainstream media or to women when they're pregnant and what they should be expecting. Um, I think that's been getting better in the last year or so, but it's definitely um, something that's still out there. So to me, I'm hoping these works invite reflection and can help start a conversation within our society about what our expectations are for those care caregiving and how we can support them. Um, our society doesn't have enough support for, for parents and moms, which has always been true, but I think has become very clear during the last few years of pandemic. Um, but I'm also hoping that the caregivers who are having challenges or not, perhaps, 
see these and feel some sort of connection, some sort of solace, some feeling that they're not alone and that their feelings have been expressed and seen out in the world. And they're not just this isolated island covered in children. Um, so yeah, that's the overview of the current work I've been working on. And um, I'm really excited to see how the embroidered towels move forward in either sculptural ways um, or having them installed in various locations. So thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. That was really wonderful to hear. Does anybody have any questions or comments for Katie? I have a couple of things that I wrote down. I do have a question. When, so you said that you take photos of you when you're feeling these extreme emotions. Whenever you go back to embroider, is it is it soon? Like, what does that process look like? Do you, do you kind of go through and you're like, okay, which, which one of these do I like relate to now? How do you, how do you pick that emotion? And is it, is it a, like a feeling that you're having that moment and that's why you choose that? Yeah, I think um, when I first started taking the pictures, I didn't think I was going to embroider them. Um, I thought maybe I would sketch them, which I have. I have, I may, these faces I think will be with me for a long time and may show up in different um, mediums, but I didn't know. So I think a few weeks or maybe months, I would have to look at the timestamps on my phone passed between when I took most of these and started to stitch them. And I first, I began with maternal rage because I think that's the one I always most identify with most. I think because that's often what feels more most intensely with me when I'm in a challenging moment. Um, but yeah, it just began with me picking the one that I most identified with, not necessarily in the moment I was stitching. I didn't stitch in rage usually. Um, I might have still been exhausted because, you know, a mother, you're often exhausted at, in the evening, especially since my practice as a primary caregiver and the only caregiver for my kids during the day, my practice is all at night. Um, so yeah, I think I chose the first one based on the one I most felt closely to or felt most intensely about. And then afterwards, I was just curious. I think I actually did rage two or three times before I moved on um, to see what stitching I would like, what colors I would like. Um, and then I moved on to see what it looked like with different emotions and different faces. And I started to see this could be a series. This could be something that is broader. I really enjoyed seeing them installed in your house too. I thought that was really interesting. Um, it really takes it and puts it into a um, very personal type experience. Mm -hmm. I, I think in these places that we're all familiar with, like the kitchen sink and things like that, um, that was really cool. So I'm excited to see what you do with that as well. That almost felt like a photography project, like a mix between the two. And that was really cool to see. Yes, that's only been, gosh, in the last three weeks or a month that I've been exploring. And it does feel very exciting. Like it's just a new light bulb and um, exploring the photography aspect of it should be fun as well. Um, there are constraints using my particular home. <laughs> my kitchen is rather small, so I couldn't physically like back away far enough from, I would need to, you know, I, I need to work with angles and things like that to get the, to get the shots they want. But I am looking forward to experimenting more and seeing um, what this develops. And I also want to try making many, many more of these. So there's like a larger quantity of them. Um, Again, kind of connecting back to my um, collage of the topography of all the lines. I had this, um, and with again, with all of the minions, I had this interest in like claustrophobia or having too much of something. And I'm looking forward to trying that with the towels as well. Just need to stitch, it takes time. <laughs> I'm excited for that. That'll be really cool. I love seeing them in context like that. I think whatever you decide to do with that, I'm excited to see it. Um, I really loved how you spoke about talking about gentle parenting and things like that. That's also something that I believe in, but you are right. Like there is not the support for mothers. We're not supposed to have the emotions. We're supposed to like be emotionless in the face of this 
but even if you understand where it's coming from when they're little, like it still feels very personal and it's still Mm -hmm. very difficult. I have a tween right now, so I can tell you (laughs) for sure it does. But um, I, yeah, I really, really liked the idea of that. And I love the idea of them as face towels, almost like, Mm -hmm. like you said, like the mother was rubbing her face on the towel and it left the expression. I think that was a really interesting way of thinking about it. So this entire project is really exciting to me. So I'm excited to see what you do next. Thank you. Yeah, Katie, that's, I'm, there's, there's so many layers. I mean, you, there's so it's so powerful. I mean, this is really, really powerful work. And I really applaud you for using your, your creativity and to, to bring this, to, to bring it out, to be able to talk about it because it, it, there is shame about it. There's no doubt about that. There's shame when we talk about maternal rage, like, but it's there, (laughs) you know, we, I think almost all of us have experienced it to various, you know, degrees and, um, but how you're how you're moving through that with your work um, is just is really strong, um, and I, I agree with Katie how you how you have them displayed. I mean, they to me as I was listening to your talk and looking at them, they were strong, just as the pieces themselves. But then you put them in context, and I was like, whoa, that just changes everything. You know, um, it's uh, yeah, and especially you know domesticity too for. I'm sure there's lots of women who don't have, you know, don't get angry when they do the dishes. And there's probably a lot of women who are like, I am so sick of doing these freaking dishes, you know, and, and having that image there to be I'm like, Oh, maybe if I just had a picture of myself, like to wipe my hands on that, I could, Oh, just like get that rage out. I don't know where I'm, what I'm trying to say, but I just, I'm really moved by your work. Um, and I, I, I really connect to the, those, those three, I don't feel so much the exhaustion anymore because my kids are, are older. It's a different kind of exhaustion as Katie knows when they're tweens, it's not baby exhaustion. It's an emotional exhaustion. Yeah. But it's but the rage and the ambivalence, they're just, they're real powerful emotions that we need to normalize. So I give you huge props for this work. It's really beautiful. Thank you, Dara. And I also, it was so interesting, our work seeing our work side by side, it's a nice contrast, the nurturing and the joy from yours and the sort of other side of the coin as mine. And I like, I like that there can be both. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I feel a lot of your work. It doesn't come out necessarily in my artwork. Oh, but it's in there, trust me. (laughs) And I feel yours too. I just, it's amazing. I'm more drawn to the, I'm drawn to the dark side when it comes to making (laughs) of the work. (laughs) Yeah. That's why there needs to be both. And I think it's wonderful yeah. to yeah. have both of you here. Does anybody else have any comments or questions for Katie? All right. Well, Heaven, let me read your bio real quick and then I will turn it over to you. Heaven Needham is an artist currently operating out of St. Louis, Missouri. Born and raised in the Midwest, this fiery chameleon has lived in Louisiana, Florida, and California. Guided by her theater and acting career, Heaven's cross-country moves and colorful homes provided limitless inspiration for art. When creating a piece, Heaven prefers using bright colors and fine lines in all different mediums. Her personal style isn't confined to genre, but one constant you will find in Heaven's art is faces and fluid colors that bring a sense of of united mayhem. She's always been obsessed with different characters she meets and tries to bring their spirit to her style with every piece. All right, I'm really excited to hear about this. Things like United Mayhem and Fiery Chameleon, I think they're so wonderful. So, all right, I'm turning it over to you. Take it away. They're very colorful words. Um, I'm not muted, right? Okay. All right, perfect. Um, well, awesome ladies. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to be here. I have never done anything like this before. I, this is the second exhibition that I've ever, ever even been involved in. Um, I entered on a whim where I had a bottle of wine and I was like, you know what? Liquid courage. Let's just do it. So um, I'm just really excited to be here and be a part of this. And it was amazing to see late night snack as the front. Um, 
I saw that while I was at work and I, I had to tell everyone I ran around like a crazy person. Um, so that was really amazing. So I, I, you know, thank you so much. So let's kind of kinda get in. That, was, that actually, I said, Marin, like what pieces are you thinking for the poster? That was the very first one she said. And whenever I had gone through, that was like, that popped out at me as well. So that was a joint decision. We both thought it was perfect. So it was just perfect. Thank you. I, I got very excited about it and I'm still excited about it and I'll tell people for years to come about it. So, um, so before I can kind of start about like where I am now, I think it's important to talk about where I kind of started as a self-taught artist. Um, I, in high school, um, I went to a very small high school and about less than hundred in my graduating class in the middle of um, Southern Missouri. So art classes were <laughs> very limited. And I had the same art teacher uh, from you know kindergarten up until high school. And she was very stuck in her ways. And one of the things that she really enjoyed um, teaching and doing was portraits. So I did a lot of portraits. And my senior year, I actually took four classes of art one because I needed credits and it was nothing but four hours of portraits. So I think that, <laughs> I think that, that really solidified you know, where I am now with my art. Um, so in the beginning, let's go to the second one. From like 2014, when I first got out of high school, I started doing abstracts, fluid, um, at painting and I started with spray paint which on the left you can see me in my garage and I do not suggest trying to do fluid art with spray paint um, it's very messy and it doesn't move like it should <laughs> like acrylic or anything like that but it was extremely challenging and I loved it I loved like the little planets that I was creating and it was really freeing um, and then the two on the right, the middle one reminds me of like lava. Um, this was all before I even started like naming my pieces or anything I just created. And then I would have a stockpile of stuff. Um, I moved on from spray paint because it was so sticky and ridiculous. And I started working with acrylic and then I kind of went into acrylic and then covering everything with resin. And that was really interesting to kind of play around and learn by making a million and one mistakes. Um, I did a lot of it outside and so just and not covering it properly and all of these things like you just I, I learned as I went and um, I messed up a lot of really cool stuff to be honest. And then um, so I, I kind of always did the abstracts and but I always went back to faces and characters and so like complicated on the left something that I really enjoyed doing was um, just doodling these like woven lines over and over again. And it was very meditating and I could sit there and not talk for three hours and just bang it out. Um, and it felt so good at the end. And it just kind of took me away from where I was, what I was doing, what I was thinking. So that was really, you know, awesome and amazing to be able to do. And then I started working in watercolor um, and playing around with that. And the middle piece was kind of a pivotal moment for me. I was living in Florida and the living situation that I was in for like three months or so, I wasn't able to paint or do anything creatively just because of space and everything was kind of packed up. I moved back to Missouri for a short period of time and I was living with my mom and I was like, I, I just felt this urge. I was like, I need to create something like now. And she, all she had was a cardboard box and she cut off side of it. And she was like, this is all I have. And so I painted that in like less than an hour. I just sat down, I, no reference usually at all. Um, I just usually just, just go with it and just keep on going and uh, building layers up. And it's one of my favorite pieces and it's on a cardboard box. And it just makes me really happy, to be honest. It's just, um, it just proved to me that like, you, sometimes you just have to let it out. 
and it doesn't matter what it's on or what medium or what you're doing. Um, and it felt really, really good to just finally have that release of being able to paint again. Um, and then, so I always kind of went back to faces and then before I bought my iPad, which I had never worked digitally, I am not a computer type of person. I, I just, no technology, not my thing. So my fiance is actually the one who was like, you need to start doing digital art. And I was like, Oh, I don't know about it. And he was, he bought me an iPad and I started working in procreate. And when I first started working in procreate, I, it was like something I didn't even realize that I was holding myself back when I was working like in acrylics and watercolor, but I was holding myself back because I was scared of messing up. And with working digitally, I was able to just sit there and play and over and over again and not be scared that I was going to waste paper or waste product or paint or, or anything like that. So it just opened up a whole other world um, where I was actually able to play. And the middle piece, you can kind of see where I, this is usually how I start anything that I do. I sit down with an empty canvas on my iPad and I just draw faces over and over again um, until one kind of speaks to me. And I'm like, oh, I like that emotion. Oh, okay. And a lot of them are not good. Um, <laughs> but then there's that one that sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, okay. Like I, I can see where that is going. Um, I got really interested in character design. And I, for a while, I thought that I wanted to go into animation until I realized that I am terrible um, at like character turnarounds and like walk cycles and all of those things. I was not interested in that. So this is kind of where that stopped for me. Um, but I still really enjoy like character development and all of those things. And they're really fun and lighthearted. So that was fun for a little bit, but it didn't still like feel like myself, like my voice wasn't coming out in it um, as much as I wanted. I did collage um, work for a little bit. And this is kind of where the surrealism aspect started to happen for me. I was able to sit in you know, my living room and have hundreds of pieces of little clippings of all these cool and interesting things that I would find and be able to put them together and create a story that felt really interesting and also at the same time out of my control that was similar to the abstract stuff that I was doing as well. So I really enjoyed this like little snippet of time that I took with collage work because I feel like it was a stepping stone to where I am now. This um, with these, I just really enjoyed being able to like play with my style. I had no idea. I was constantly looking for my style. And for a while, it was frustrating me because I'm like, I feel like I'm creating all of these different things all the time. And I don't have my voice or, you know, you can't look at it and see me. Now, looking back, I look at those things and I think that's really silly because now I can see um, the themes in it. But in the moment, I didn't feel like that at all. And I just felt like I was searching for something. Um, and I just played a lot with the alien on the left and, and lighting and textures and being able to work digitally like that was, was really cool. Um, and I still always did like the faces and just played with my style a lot, trying to find what felt like home. I would get kind of bored uh, with the digital stuff because I felt like I still couldn't say what I wanted to say. So I, I would go back to, you know, working more abstract with acrylics and, you know, pen work and ink. Um, and so I did a lot of series of where I would, you know, just get a piece of paper, I would make a whole bunch of smears of acrylic paint, and then whatever I would see, I would just draw over the top. Um, and it's always usually faces. The one on the right uh, is called Dancer. And that was the first one that I started with this. And it just started off with the pink smears. And then I saw movement within it. And those therapeutic little lines just just took over and it was amazing and then this kind of started my love for pink I think this is the first time that I actually saw how bright and fun all of these colors made it and then we come to thirsty 
So this was actually the first piece that I did digitally. And you can kind of see like the process on the right, which I think is amazing with digital stuff, like to be able to go back and kind of see exactly every little movement. And this one actually, it, it went so like natural. It was really easy. And I think that is what like catapulted me into where my art is now, like this exact piece, the bright color, the, the, just the oddness of it. It felt weird. It makes me look at it and it makes me a little uncomfortable. And I think I really like that with my art. I enjoy looking at it and being like, oh, it's so bright and it's really fun, but it's a little odd and it, it it's a little creepy at times. <laughs> um, and I don't necessarily always know what it means until I, I go back after a little bit of time. Um, and I'm like, oh, this is what I was feeling at that time. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, the thirsty, I, I'm not really sure if I was thirsty. I, I, I'm not really sure about that. Um, I do know that I really started with the eyes. The eyes are a constant in all of my work now. Um, and it's so fun to be able to like get so expressive with all of the folds of them. Eyes don't actually have that many folds, but being able to give it that exaggerated feel um, is really cool. And I've I've had a lot of fun with it. And then we kind of go into how this, how that started something in my brain. I was like, okay, this makes me feel good. I feel comfortable. I feel like finally I'm, you know, myself in this work. And then I started to really, you know, hone in on my concepts and what I wanted to say. And I started going into my own like mental health and uh, what I was feeling. So I would focus on one emotion and the piece on the left was sadness. And for me, sadness, I feel it in my eyes. I feel it behind them and I can't shake it a lot of times. And so that feeling, um, it was all about the eyes for me, just being sad um, and holding that here. And then we're all a little crazy. So he looks absolutely insane and I love him. He's so cute. Um, but he, <laughs> to me, I, a lot of times feel like I'm, I'm being a, too much um, and I'll, I'll have anxiety days after events or, or something. And I'm like, oh, was I too big or, you know, should I have not said that? Or, you know, I, I overanalyze things. So I was feeling that in the moment when I did this and it made me feel better to know that we're all a little crazy, like we're all a little odd um, and it's okay to be that. So he makes me laugh though, I, I like him. And then rage. So this emotion, I definitely um, feel and looking at it it's not that my face ever shows that of course and you had talked about how you know you would take photos of yourself but I I tried to think of like okay my face is never going to look like that but on the inside that's exactly how I'm feeling in the moment and it just like that spitting anger and the steam and my whole body feeling hot so I really wanted to show the heat and just like the, just the rawness of what rage can be on the inside. Um, on the right, brave. As a kid, I always, I always looked up to people who had a lot of tattoos and a lot of piercings and crazy hair color and, and things like that. So being brave and like authentically you, that's exactly what I thought of. I was like, if you want to get a nose piercing, you get a nose piercing. If you want to have pins hanging out of your ear and you have the confidence to do that, that's amazing. So I wanted to create someone that I would look at and be like, wow, like they're very confident in themselves and they don't care what anyone else thinks. With digital work, it was really fun to be able to take things that I used to do um, in sketchbooks and everything, and then reinvent them in the digital world and be able to really get like nitty gritty with the details. And I think that that is present in all of my work. Um, I have really bad 
eyesight. And so I feel like that my iPad helps me be able to like really zoom in and see the fine details with it. And with the fish, those re like repetitive lines like came back in and I was able to like bring in color and um, rainbow fish, you know, as a book, as a child was always my favorite. And I feel like as a grown up looking at this, it's a trippy version of that for sure. Um, but it, it feels very familiar. And I really enjoyed uh, working on that one and kind of bringing a little sketchbook page more depth. Going back to like revisiting old pieces, I, I used to just play with so many styles when I was trying to search for something that felt like me. And this piece, I always kind of came back to and I always wanted to redo it because the left, it was very simple. Um, and I felt like redoing it, I was able to say what I wanted to say a little, a little bit better. Um, this for me, see yourself. I feel like there's a disconnect between brain and body a lot of the times and being able to, who I, who I see myself like in my own brain and then I look in the mirror there's just, there's just a disconnect. And I feel like a lot of times um, I'll look at myself and I'm like, I feel like I'm not in the right vessel almost, you know, I, I feel more colorful. I feel more of this and, and I can accessorize and all of those things. And I, I can't really um, explain it. So it was important for me to create someone who has one eye, a cyclops, and just staring at yourself and like you see yourself in this squiggly, weird, odd way while everyone else kind of sees you in like this normal light. So it was fun to revisit her. Now to kind of where I am and the two pieces that we have in this show, um, multiple views. So this piece, honestly, it was just therapy. It was therapy for me. Um, and I just always kind of go back to those repetitive lines and the eyes and the yellow behind it really kind of, um, it illuminates it. And it made me feel like everyone has multiple views and there's eyes on, on so many different things. And uh, honestly, it's just therapy. <laughs> I, I feel like most of my work is just sitting through and trying to get out what emotion. And I feel like this piece specifically, I will really know what it means in like three months. I'll be able to look back and be like, oh, that's like, that's exactly how I was feeling then. Right now, it's still a little abstract for me and I can't grasp it yet, um, which I think is really cool with art. Now, late night snack. This one was just silly. Um, to be honest, I, I went into it wanting to draw a tongue. I knew that I wanted to draw a tongue and you can kind of see I start with, you know, like a teary eye again and the pizza just kind of came to it. I'm pretty sure I had pizza for dinner that night and I was like, I like pizza late night and that I didn't put in the fridge like a normal person and I'm just going to snack on it. Um, so late night snack was just this exaggerated hole in the wall sitting in the room and some I just imagined someone dangling a piece of pizza right in front of me in that moment and what that would feel like for me um what I really like about like these like time lapses is you can see I always I always start off with like a rough sketch and then I go in with my color and then you just get more detailed and more detailed um I usually do so many passes with my my like final sketching, I'll do like a light, like a lighter um, brown, and then I go in with like a lighter purple, and then it's a darker purple, and then I fine line it with like dark black. And I just love like the depth that that can give me with these. Um, and being able to play with it and change it over and over again. Every little little piece of it. Like at the end of this, you can kind of see where I'm like, oh, maybe, you know, I'm going to suck, suck it into the wall a little bit. Um, it's just really fun. I really am glad that I started working digitally because I feel like I would have never made half of the things um, or been brave enough to even try half of the things that I have created. And so I'm very thankful. 
and my face. So yeah, that's me. And the kind of the crazy weird world that my brain lives in. I love that. <laughs> well, does anybody have any statements or questions for heaven before I launch in? Um, I just want to say I love how you convey emotion and um, just like the exaggeration and you can really feel it and it pulls you in and how it's a little odd. Um, and knowing the story behind these makes it much more powerful for me because I think um, I could spend, you know, a few minutes looking at them and be like, it's odd, but what does it mean? And I think knowing the story for me really helps. And your use of color, the kind of rainbow gradient, that's like your style that you seem to be drawn is flawless. It, I would, I mean, I know I saw a little bit of how it was done, but it was just like, that seems amazing. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure if you could do it as smoothly with actual paint, but I love how that's done. And I love how you give me a fun and another way to think about anxiety or even just thirst or hunger. Um, it's really easy to relate to and um, I mean, just make the emotions more fun in a way. Well, thank you. I don't think that I could do, um, I've tried to do it with acrylics and, and oils is a lot easier, um, but I, I just, I can't get it in the same way that I can digitally, which, which I wish I, I, I wish I kind of could, cause I, I, you know, um, I like to work in both, but I can't reach um, those color gradients yet without working digitally. So thank you. That was very sweet of you. So I was really excited to have digital art in the show. I think digital art's really important on two different levels for me. One is just simply exactly what you're doing. You're being able to create without worrying about the materials, without worrying about messing anything up, you're being able to create exactly what you feel. And I think that that's something that's really special that has come about really in the last 10 years, in the last five years to a point. And um, I know my daughter watches YouTube videos. She does procreate these little characters all the time, but she watches YouTube videos of these YouTubers who use procreate to create their characters and their art. And they make like vague animation and stuff. And it's just for what they're saying, but they're able to tell their stories in a different way. It's really relevant. It's really important. I think um, it's exciting to see what you're doing with it. I love how you expressed how you're capturing emotion like there's this part of therapy that's very much like how do emotions feel in your body and I think your work a lot of it really brings that to the forefront and that's a really cool thing to me so I love that yeah I I really I really try to imagine what like exactly what my body is feeling in that um so that I can look at it later and be like, oh, well, yeah, I was definitely angry. <laughs> I was definitely hungry, like, oh my goodness. And sometimes, you know, if I don't go into it with an emotion um, right off the bat and I just start to doodle, then later on I'll be able to look at it and, you know, uh, be able to say like, okay, that's what I was feeling then. So, yeah. That is a cool part of art. That's all of my art that I do, which I don't do very much okay I can't say I don't do digital art I create <laughs> entire shows but um I think that that's maybe one of the things that made me so excited about it launching myself more and more into the virtual realm into the virtual art world I see this artwork as really important as really relevant um I wouldn't even want it to be anything else I think it's so important as what it is and um that's a really cool thing. And I love how you're taking that and running with it. Yeah, it, it's been weird though. I, I feel like people have like a stigma uh, with like digital art a lot of times. Um, mm -hmm. Even myself, when my fiance told me to get an iPad, I'm like, no, I'm an artist. If I don't have a paintbrush in my hand, then it's not real. It's not physical. Um, so that, that, that's been difficult for people. I feel like a lot of people will ask like, oh, you, you work digitally. Like, 
I, and I don't know, there's just like a layer with it where, oh, you're not a real artist. Oh, it must take you two seconds. Um, and I promise you that's not the case. <laughs> not at all. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, because, you know, it's it, if you think about the, the platform of what it is, it's it's just a tool. Right. So you're 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 creating something and you're just using this as your tool. It yeah. doesn't make it any better or less than a pencil or a paintbrush. Those are just tools. Yeah, but they're not, they don't, the pencil or the paintbrush doesn't create the work. <laughs> you create the work. So, you know, that, that argument is, I mean, I'm sure you get it. Don't get me yeah. wrong, but like yeah. to make that mm -hmm. argument, you think to people, well, that's not really a good argument. Like it's just I mean, a tool I'm using. I know? feel like people think that I have like stickers or like a paintbrush that is specifically for hair, you know, or uh, like, uh -huh. like those, those type of things, which I'm sure that they're, they're out there. Um, it, like brush packs that you can buy that make things a lot easier. Um, but it, yeah, it, it's just comical. They're like, Oh, but you could draw an eye just by a stamp. And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not how it goes. It's really I think cool it'll, oh, sorry. yeah, I was going to say, I think that that argument is going to start to fall off more and more. I think so too. Mm -hmm. As we moved into 2020 and so much moved into virtual, I see it in what I'm doing with the gallery. There are still large sections of the art world where there's this pushback of saying, that's not real. That's not a real gallery, et cetera. And, but more and more, it's becoming more and more relevant. It's becoming more and more important because this is the sort of thing that really can bring everyone from all over the world. Anyone, anywhere can have procreate, not anyone anywhere can create what you create. And I think that's gonna become more and more obvious to people as we move forward. Well, thank you. Yeah, and those time lapses, I was going to say, that is such a cool it uh, really is. function mm -hmm. of, that, yeah. of that platform that you're able to see this, this, it almost is like a secondary piece. It's like when yeah. you make it in printmaking, you know, you run your print through the press and then what you get after that on your plate, you can, it's called a ghost print and you can get a secondary and it's a, it's different, but it's, it, it's, it looks different, but it's made from the same thing. It, it's almost like you have these two different like you have a video and right you have your your you know your your actual the, the final piece it's really cool I've never seen I've never seen that before but it's pretty intriguing it's fun to watch them back and see like the like the moment where it turned yeah <laughs> the, mo the moment yeah. that you know changed it completely yeah. um because you don't even I, I a lot of times I don't even realize that it's happening and then being able to watch it back and I'm like oh okay that's that's the step that I took that really made this piece now, you know, um, I, I really enjoy it. You guys yeah, should all, you, I, you I, as the artist get that, you know, you get that. It's like, like note-taking. You know? right, like, exactly. Oh, yeah. I chose to do it this way because of this, but you can actually see it. I mean, that is, yeah. that is so cool. And oftentimes it's like a highlight, right? Like, oh, this is where the blue came in. And it was like, yeah wow, <laughs> that totally changed everything and it became what it is. It's, that's really cool to see. Well, does anybody have any more comments or questions for heaven? Or do you have anything else that you wanted to say? All right, well, thank just you thank all you. so much. What was that? I said, just thank you. I'm so honored. Honestly, you both of you ladies are amazing. And yeah, I'm, I'm just, really honored to uh, be able to speak with you guys and like be next to you and hear your stories. It, it was, it was really amazing. Likewise. Well, it was amazing to hear yours too. And it was, it was really exciting to hear it. And thank you so much for being here. All of you, thank you so much for being here and for sharing. It's not an easy thing. I, I know that, but um, it means so much to the show. It means so much to me that you're here and really am. Um, sharing yourselves and your art and we get to know a little bit more about it it's really exciting to go back afterwards and look at the art and to get another feel for it after you know the stories behind it and whatnot so thank you all so much for being here and thank you to everyone who has joined us thank you to everyone who will be watching this on youtube afterwards and um, we'll wrap it up for tonight so see you next time thank you thank you
Bye.